Hello, welcome to the Thinkers 50 Radar 2022 series, brought to you in partnership with Deloitte. I'm Des Dearlove. And I'm Stuart Craner. We're the founders of Thinkers 50, the world's most reliable resource for identifying, ranking and sharing the leading management ideas of our age, ideas that can make a real difference in the world. In this weekly series of 45 minute webinars, we want to showcase some of those ideas to bring you the most exciting new voices in management thinking. So please let us know where you are joining from today and send over your questions at any time during the session. And it's always especially exciting to have a guest who's someone who's really putting ideas into practice. And that's what we've got today. And he's Tom van der Lube. Tom is the co-founder of Vizi, a financial services company that offers customized mortgage solutions. Prior to founding Vizi in 2010, Tom worked for MLP, where he was responsible for the Dutch and Swiss subsidiaries. Before that, he started his professional career at McKinsey. Uh, Vizi is a remarkable company. Its purpose is to change the world of finance, to make the industry better, more sustainable and more focused on the long term. Tom, one of your core beliefs is that we should leave the world in a better shape than it was when we were born. How does the creation of Vizi fit into that mission? Oh, that's a very good question. But first, thanks uh, for having me. Um, I think, let's say, the the, the general uh, opinion about the financial sector is not so positive, uh, and I think that's a that's a correct opinion. Uh, but it's a it's a sector which is enormously important for the whole economy. Uh, so so we think that uh, the financial sector should be about serving industry, but also uh, the normal population. Uh, and, and, and that's something different uh, if you compare this with, let's say, day trading or um, uh, this, this, kind of, uh, this kind of aspects we know from the financial sector. And with the whole discussion about climate change, I think everybody understands that we should leave the world in a better shape than we uh, have found it. And at the moment, it's exactly the opposite. So, so Vizzy started life in, in 2010. What, what, was the, what was the genesis of the company, Tom? Um, yeah, actually, it was um, it was it was because of the fact that uh, we used to work for a big corporate financial advisor, which is stock listed in Germany, uh, and then and then there was a, a change of uh, leadership in the company. CFO became CEO, uh, and what do CFOs often do when they take over? They just take the balance sheet or the Excel sheet, and they just cut everything which has to do with future growth. Um, and then all those subsidiaries were closed. And then we were just sitting there and said, okay, well, we're going to do. Should we just uh, apply somewhere else or what shall we do? We're just very lucky in hindsight that 10 years ago we didn't have. A That's probably the best way to become entrepreneurs, I think. But but this company is very different. I mean, the way the way it's set up, the way it's structured, the way it's organized. Can you, I mean, it, it's, it's not something you're going to, you're going to be able to explain in in a couple of sentences, I know. But give us, can you give us just a, a, a feel for how it's different? Um, yeah, I have to I have to say that let's say I have a totally different background uh, uh, in comparison to a lot of other people who build financial sector companies. I'm a historian, uh, and I'm I'm educated in let's say understanding how states evolved and this kind of stuff. And 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 I always was amazed when I moved into the business. That and you talk about uh, Frederick Taylor and, and how you organize stuff and about management, etc. And I always compare this with the stuff I studied in the university. And I thought this this that's very strange. Uh, if I if I just see the development of armies or how states evolve, uh, you have always decentralized decision making. Mm -hmm. So you can dive into armies, but you can also dive in in states. And and if you, for instance, see the development of states, it's called sub subsidiarity principle eh? that let's say you do you decide something in a city and then you're in a province or a canton and then on a national level but you don't mix this up all the time and you have a lot of structure if you talk about trias politica or how a parliament is organized etc and then i just watched how businesses or organizations are built and i thought mm, this that's very strange i find this the way states are organized much more advanced because you still understand that the complexity makes it necessary to have decentralized decision making. So that was more or less the starting point. 
And the other thing was that we said, uh, if you have experience because you have worked in a company, you mostly, most people don't like to be micromanaged. So we, we said, okay, when the company will be successful, because we were, let's say, only four people in the beginning, uh, what, what, what shall we do? Do we also start to micromanage our people or can we still remember that the starting point was we will try to build a company because we don't want to be micromanaged? So these were the two, let's say, initial starting points. And, and how you, big is the organ? Sorry, so how big is the organization now? How many you got? Sort of forty people. We're sixty-three now. Sixty-three, okay. But we are growing gradually because one of the principles also is that uh, we don't have extor uh, external investors, so we have to grow from our own profits. And especially in the beginning, that takes much longer than if you would have, let's say, enormous amount of money from outside, which at the moment seems to be in a lot of cases, the normal way of building companies. Yeah, I think we should say as well that not all not all nation states are decentralized. I mean, you, you, you live in Switzerland, Tom, which is kind of an exemplar of what you were talking about with its cantons and uh, its different different ways of working. We, we, we're based in the UK, which is actually very centralized as, 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 as a nation. Yeah, I would I would even would say yes and no. So uh, also in the in the, if you take Great Britain, uh, it also has a lot of aspects of decentralized decision making. So you still you still decide something in the city of London, and not discussing this in the House of Parliament. Mm. No. But let's say in organizations, it can be that the CEO decides through all those layers and just comes and says, "This is my opinion. We're going to do it like this." Yeah, and that, and that's the reason that that, that Stuart is involved with local government and is running for office. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, to decentralize decision making away from me. Um, Tom, you you had experience working with McKinsey, which which is very very different structure and uh, approach to organizational life. How did that inform your kind of creation of Visi? Oh, that I w I would say let's say the lessons I took from my let's say working career, let's say working for others. That was mainly taken from the company we used to work before as a financial advisor. So, so that was not about McKinsey. Let's say I was I, I just started at McKinsey, but I didn't like it. So I didn't like to to go somewhere and tell other people what to do. So, which is probably also fits to what I said before. So, so this whole idea that I mean you can be very very smart and it also can be very interesting to analyze something, but in the end I find it much more fulfilling to really do it myself because there's an enormous amount of difference between analyzing something mm -hmm. and, and doing it in practice. Uh, so a lot of people were able to analyze stuff, but if it would be so easy, then a lot of smart McKinsey consultants would be extremely good entrepreneurs, which is not the case. So, so it must be probably more difficult to build something than to analyze something. Yeah, and th the model that, that, you, that you apply, is the, I mean, it has been described as holacracy, um, is, is that a is that a term that you recognize and think about or, or do you see it more as a as a kind of a unique culture? Um, I, I would say both both things are, are correct. So on the one hand, holacracy has a lot of principles taken from uh, sociocracy, which, by the way, is a Dutch invention. Um, uh, but let's say. Um, Let's say Brian, who, who, who developed with the IT background, uh, Holacracy, uh, made a very practical model out of, out of the soci sociocratic principles. So if somebody wants to start with decentralized decision making, Holacracy is a good starting point. But uh, from the beginning, we said we're not building uh, a Holacracy company because one of the main aspects, for instance, in our, in our company wouldn't be let's say taken very seriously by by Brian Robertson, because in our model, the one who, who leads a team or the company is chosen by the team members, which in holacracy is not the case. Mm -hmm. uh, and the other thing is also that we we have a rotation principle. So, and that's that's the link for instance, to also to the, to the Swiss government, but it's the old Republican principle that if you have a team, let's say of four or six people, 
then every half a year somebody else is in the lead of the team. That's why it's called president. Eh? So you, 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 you're you're the one who is who is let's say primus in the paris who is who is who is in the lead, but it's still based on a on a on a on an equal basis um, with 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 the team members, which is not uh, which is something which is not the case in holacracy. And how does that fit with the so so you have a if, as it were a team leader which as you say rotates and then each team or each unit each part how who manages or who leads the integration you know the sort of the um the, the horizontal if you like the, across across teams is that the same individual or does or is that somebody else now you still have this let's say this this lead link and rep link so this double linking yeah the two two people of every team they go to the next level so there's still a hierarchy in yeah. the organization but those people are chosen by the team itself is and in holacracy only the rep link the representative is chosen and the lead link is a top-down decision and that in our company that's not the case so both roles are chosen by by the by their peers and mm-hmm. and the old principle and there's this historic tradition it's the old republican tradition which you also see in Venice or Amsterdam, et cetera, these trading cities, the cities in a Republican tradition are governed by the families and they also rotate. So if you take, let's say, Asian painting in the Netherlands or in Italy, and Venice is a very good example, then you see, if you visit Venice, you see those, those people governing the city and they are from all those families and they, they were able to do this for a thousand years between 700 and 17,700. But we have forgotten a little bit about this. The only aspect where you can still see this is on the one hand in a very pure form in Switzerland, where the, the government rotates or the, the, the president is somebody is, 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 is rotating uh, uh, job, so to say. So every year somebody else of the government is in charge of this role. And where you can also see that that the principle of avoiding too much power or for a too long period. You can see this in the American elections or the American presidency, where you're only allowed to have this job for 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 two times. So, so so you if you would dive into this, you can still find a lot of those examples. But we have forgotten about this. And this whole principle, which is perhaps the core, is that power corrupts automatically, and absolute power corrupts even in a more even severe way. So. And if we just watch our own politicians, uh, we have a lot of situations where we where we think, okay, it would be better to re- rotate uh, more often to avoid this. I think it'd be better to eliminate rather than rotate in the political sense. I think. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm interested, Tom, how this evolved. I mean, you weren't you you, you hadn't been entrepreneurial before, but you and you and, and your co-founders started the company as entrepreneurs, and you went in with some fundamental ideas. But, for instance, not micromanaging. But something like not micromanaging is, is a really nice idea. We all, we all get it. But when it comes down to it, you're in a small company. It's your company. You've got skin in the game. You're under pressure. And you end up, usually, people end up micromanaging. So how do you stay true to your initial principles? And how have they evolved? Um, we started with a model uh, from the beginning, which a hierarchy uh, of stakeholders. So it's the purpose, and that's where you started our session with changing the financial sector. And it can be very practical, giving better advice, be more transparent, etc. So that's very practical. And then you have a hierarchy of stakeholders. It's it's the people first. So it's not the client first. It's the people first in the company. It's a little bit like Richard Branson also always always explains if you have if your own people are happy then your clients are happy and then in the end your shareholders are happy so this is not a model we invented most small and medium sized enterprises do it in exactly the same way and then you start to evolve around those core principles and then you take as an example you decide that if you hire people people who do the work they decide together let's say in a small company, then then uh, you decide together who are you going to hire. And then you're starting to discuss um, what what other, let's say, topics do you have? And then, and then the system evolves. But if the starting point is, for instance, putting people first, then the logical next step is to listen to them 
what do you need to be able to do the work in the most excellent way? Yeah, no, that makes sense. We, we've got good, some good questions coming in, but just want, I just want to stay with a bit more of the detail of, of your organization because another thing that, that's unusual is that, um, you know, it, it is total transparency over salaries and people discuss and, um, and, and set their own salaries in effect. I think that, that's correct. Can you say a little bit about that? Yeah. Okay, we'll start with radical transparency because let's say if you are in a UK, a UK environment, where does it come from? It doesn't come from IT people nowadays, but it's, it it's, it's, it's originally comes from England. So uh, in the parliament, they started to write down what was, what was discussed in the parliament uh, in the pub at the other side of the street. And so if you Google Wikipedia radical transparency, there it comes from. And, 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 and that you can enter, for instance, the parliament and listen to the debates or, or, or in a lot of countries where you have laws which, which, which define that everything which is discussed in parliament has to be, be public, publicly accessible to the, to the audience or to the public, there, that, that's where it comes from. And then, and then you have certain countries, for instance, Scandinavian countries, where it's very normal, but also in the past, that it's very normal that people know what you earn. You can still see, for instance, if you apply for a job in a university, that in a lot of countries it says C4 or whatsoever, and then everybody, or you, you, you apply in a job in the States, and, and, and then you know what the person will, will earn or what, 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 what the, let's say, the salary benchmark uh, would be. So, so. I always say we didn't invent the stuff. We're just putting the puzzle pieces together. And if you have the purpose to be to change the financial sector, whereas a lot of intransparent uh, stuff going on, then then it's 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 normal that at a certain point you say, okay, why don't we just share this, or why aren't we just very clear about our fees if it's including VAT or not or something? So sometimes it can be very practical and in the beginning for instance this was not the case and we said okay we're very clear about what the advice will cost we were lucky that the regulator uh, changed this uh, so so we don't get any kickbacks from from banks for for the mortgages we we, we sure are serving to our customers so but you dive into this and you will always ask the question when i would approach this company as an outsider what would i like to know but for instance, also this organizational model, when we implemented Holacracy, we also put this online. And then a lot of self-organizing companies approached us and said, your organizational model, Glassrock from Holacracy is open to the public. Are you sure? I said, yes, that's sure. But it's, it's very efficient. So from a scientific point of view, radical transparency is, the, is an enormous efficiency driver because it has it has different aspects. On the one hand, everybody thinks much more severely and profoundly. What am I doing? Because it will be will be publicly accessible for everybody. On the other hand, you have to live your principles, because everybody is watching you and saying, "Hey, I found uh, this on your website," and that can be a small mistake, but. It also could be that people are approaching you and say, "I don't understand this. You are saying this, and I read I read that," and then and then you also. But you know this in advance. So, and secrecy has exactly the opposite uh, uh, effect, or uh, uh, yeah, leads lead, lead, leads to a, a lot of misunderstandings. And then you evolve on this, and then we started to to publish our salary model, and then we started to add the salaries when people apply for jobs at our company, which is very efficient. So, but there's exactly the same. So if you would apply at a company and you have to ask yourself all the time, when I am allowed to ask what the salary would be, et cetera, it's also very inefficient. So we just said, okay, just put this in the beginning. And we say, if you apply for this job and you have this amount of years of experience, you will earn this. And then the person can decide, do you want to apply for this job or not? Mm. But it's just a um, yeah. process. Yeah. Um, I mean, you talk about um, radical um, transparency and there's an echo of, I mean, we, we spent some time with Reed Hastings from Netflix and they have, they talk about radical candor and they in recent years of, of Reed's been trying to introduce the transparency to the salary structure so that everybody, 
knows what everybody else is earning. Obviously, they're a much bigger organization than, than you. But I know they suffered some, let's call it turbulence. Uh, it's not, you know, it, as you make that journey, it's um, it was fraught with some difficulty. Not everybody was comfortable with it. And I think they're still on that journey. Did you find that? Or did people take to it immediately? Or, or did you find people, you know, have to warm I've, up to the idea? Yeah, I've, I've read the book of Reed Hastings. And uh, I, I, by the way, we talked about book podcast. I also... Uh, yeah. Uh, did a did a did a talk on that. Um, the problem is that uh, sometimes people want to copy something and they take one puzzle piece of the whole puzzle and it doesn't work. So let's say if you talk about radical transparency about salaries, then I have to explain in two or three sentences what the model is. So we have fixed salaries, and we don't have only fixed salaries for somebody who is starting, but we also have fixed salaries for the next 40 years. So if somebody starts as a consultant at our company and does mortgage advice, then somebody will get a salary increase 40 years every year, 200, 200 euro. And that creates, let's say, security mm. at this moment, but also for the future. Then there is a totally, we, we, have, we have split salary from performance reviews, for instance, and we don't have any bonuses. I mean, Reed Hastings in Netflix, he, 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 he tries to mix a lot of stuff, but if you still, for instance, have bonuses and you and you want to, let's say... Uh, I think he's trying to get rid of the bonuses. I don't, I don't know how that's going. I mean, last time I saw him, he, he was saying, you know, no bonuses. But um, Okay, perhaps he, 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 he yeah. abolished it. But uh, that's something which, for instance, is the same with Google. So if you, if you talk a lot about psychological safety and you write a lot about Amy Edmondson and on the other hand, you have a bonus system... Then, yeah, then, it, then, then, wh why should people work together? Because they know that the remuneration will be based on their individual performance. So, so you have to, you can't, if you really want to build this kind of model, you have to be very clear and understand that it's it's all interlinked to each other. Hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, let's, let's go to some questions from the audience. Uh, first one from John Coleman. Um, I think it'd be good to just to clarify because people might not be clear on what these terms are he says what's your view on how sociocracy differs from holacracy can can, can you explain uh, explain the two terms as you understand them because they might yeah not that's be yeah that's i mean radar. that's i mean uh, uh, let's say if you're not a specialist in this field uh, uh then you're going to dive really deep so let's say first if people want to are interested in this topic i i i i did a long conversation of an hour and a half with um with one of the leading figures in sociocracy, but I would say the main difference is that that um, the the Brian Robertson took the social uh, sociocracy as a model, but from an American perspective, he he took the strong leadership and the top down aspect. So to put it very simple, I would say soci sociocracy is much more bottom up, and holacracy is much more top down if you talk for instance about the central role of the lead of the of the of the of the lead link but that's that's really a topic where you can which you can discuss uh, one hour and and it also depends if you're really uh, into 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 this uh, aspects i would say for for this talk it's much more interesting to focus on what they have in common and what they have in common is that you have roles which are parts of functions and you have decentralized decision making and you have this kind of double linking, which means that the team leader and a the representative, they go together to the next level. Mm. I hope I explained this uh, in a practical way. Yeah. Okay. Um, looking for some more questions. Um, Frank asks, um, he says, I like that leaders are chosen by peers. Um, to what extent did the direct democracy in Switzerland inspire you to do this? Um, I live in Switzerland, although the company is in the Netherlands. Um, but actually, I had the, the idea since uh, since I studied ancient history. So what I find very interesting is that this whole this whole problems with power and absolute power and corrupting uh, power power corrupts. Uh, that's something which which you see since thousands of years, and I found it as a student extremely interesting to study, uh, let's say, Greek politicians or philosophers. Mm -hmm. And I thought, okay, they were dealing with exactly the same uh, stuff. 
and, and, and they have this in primus inter pares principle of rotation. So that's where it actually comes from. And then when I moved to Switzerland 20 years ago, I just, I, 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 although I studied also this kind of stuff in the university, I, I never knew that much about the Swiss model that I learned this in university. And then I, since I live here, uh, I, I just thought, okay, it still exists in practice. So it's, it's, it's a little bit of both, so to say. I think, I mean, what's really interesting is, as you say, I mean, there are thousands of years of political philosophy in terms of trying to understand and manage societies and organizations and trying to create ideal states. And yet business and management seems to just have binned all that and gone to its own, um, you know, command and control sort of model initially, a very mechanistic um, you know, we, we blame Frederick Taylor for lots of things, but it does seem that we that there was all this other knowledge and other places to learn from. But we, we took the organizational blueprint from from somewhere else completely. What I find interesting as a historian is what I always said is that enlightenment has not reached management yet. So so we still have this kind of of, let's say, absolute power. It, we talk about strong leadership and now it evolves to em empathetic leadership. Mm -hmm. But I would say, okay, it's like Frederick the Great, who, who is a nice guy and wants to do the best for the people, but it's not parliamentary democracy. And then enlightenment comes and then you have the whole involvement or the whole development of, re of, of re the classical Republican tradition where, where you have this development of the Dutch Republic, but also, also other republics and the, and the city-states, etc., where where, where you have people who govern their own cities uh, and, and those are the families of this city, but it's not the classical uh, monarchy. So if you, if you visit Amsterdam, you have a lot of those houses uh, of the merchants, but you don't find uh, uh, Versailles uh, and, and, and a youth um, uh, castle because although we have a king at the, at, in the Netherlands at the moment, it's not, it doesn't have this this classical uh, tradition, which you can find in France, as an example. There's a question from Anna Nielsen, who's in Minneapolis, on how does shared power impact employee satisfaction? So you said you, the employee, employees first. Oh, that's a, that's a very nice question, um, because, um, yeah, there is enormous influence. So, I mean, if you dive into literature, uh, it's it's always about autonomy uh, and then mastery in a sense of purpose. Eh? Daniel Pink, Thrive, the book is called. He's probably also on your list. I'm not I'm not 100 percent sure, mm -hmm. but um, I, I probably he is. Uh, and the funny thing is that we um, we uh, we were this number one uh, great place to work a couple uh, let's say the last three years in the Netherlands and 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 also number one in Europe. But the main thing was that. People said we trust each other for a hundred percent, and it also has to do with the psychological safety and and sharing power with other people. So it is not about, let's say, those people who have founded the company, etc. No, it's doing together something with your peers, and 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 that's in the end what people like. Okay. Um Christine asks, I mean, you, you've been very clear that this isn't a model that you can sort of um, just pick up piecemeal you, you've, you've really got to think it through but she asks what would you recommend people to do to start with if they want to copy your model or move in this direction i mean you've got to start somewhere yeah what i think it depends a little bit on the on the let's say on the situation let's say if you have a huge corporation i would just just start somewhere in a small team where 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 you let's say can just experiment with the stuff um, and then, then create a safe environment because, let's say, research shows that if you talk about agility or, or I mean, take, eh, take, take the award we got uh, from you, the higher zero distance award, in the end, if you have a huge company, you have a much more severe interest to experiment with decentralized decision making. If you are a company like, like we are with 63 people, we can still let's say sit together in one room. But if you have a, a, a let's say multinational uh, with, I don't know, 100,000 people, then you should start to experiment, uh, I would say pretty fast and, and perhaps look what higher does 
or also here Bosch Power Tools, eh, 40,000 people. Bosch has, I think, 300 or 400,000 people. And they, they have also started somewhere. And then you, now you have Bosch Power Tools. And then you compare in your in your huge multinational what, what works well. And probably all the indicators show that people are much more happy to work for Bosch Power uh, Tools than for other parts of the Bosch uh, multinational. I suppose that begs the question: Can can your can your approach be scaled, Tom, or is there an optimum uh, level? I was thinking of uh, was it Dunbar's number of 150 people being the op op optimal size of a group? You don't want to grow any bigger than that. Have, have you have you got any numbers in mind, or do you do you see that you could grow your organisation to 20,000 people and and maintain yeah. this level this approach? Yeah, the last one, but that's also because let's say for for us. Let's say the 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 we we watch more uh, the really big organizational stuff. So we would take let's say the Roman Empire and 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 the Roman army where you have let's say six or seven people and they choose their own people their their own leader and and sleeping together in one tent, or uh, you take you would for instance take um, uh, yeah the 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 examples I I took from from the state. If you take the European Union, you can dis discuss a lot about that stuff doesn't uh, could be much better, but you still have, let's say, 300 year, uh, million people and you still have decentralized decision making in small villages uh, about about um, it doesn't matter what it is. So so I think you can scale endlessly, but the bigger you want to become as a company, you more you really have to be uh, to focus on 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 the structure. So, but it's the same for the state. So you have to, if you want to survive as a as a state, you have to be you have to come up with trios politica, because otherwise, I mean, if you you have to create checks and balances, so to say. You you mentioned you just mentioned structure, and I've just, the word structure just caught my eye. Um, Sean is asking, in any governance structure, <clears throat> does democracy with its Achilles heel? The majority isn't necessarily right, always trump a benevolent dictator, which I think we were alluding to earlier, with good advisors, for instance. The East, for example, seems to prefer the latter. Yeah, there's always, I mean, there's always a discussion you have. Let's say if you, you can dive into into decision-making principle of consent. So it's not it's not about, it's not the dictatorship of the majority which is also interesting because if you study Greek uh, mm -hmm. philosophy or Greek, uh, Greek um, uh, ancient history, you have exactly the same debate, Aristotle against Plato. So um, it's about the consent principle, which, which probably, I, perhaps I should even have mentioned this, if it's about sociocracy and, 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 and holacracy, the consent principle for those, it's not consensus. So the consent principle is that you take everybody is taking into this decision-making process. It's like, it's like, and it's also called governance in holacracy. And it follows again, the way legislation is voted on in parliament. So you have, you have this evolving process of amendments and, 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 and then in the end in the parliament, let's say they vote and then it's a majority decision, but in holacracy it's about, or in sociocracy it's about consent. You're trying to integrate let's say the feedback until everybody says, yeah, this is the best way of taking this decision. And this constant principle is incredibly powerful. Interesting. There's an interesting point from Rick Spann, who's also in uh, the Netherlands. Uh, he says, I would be curious what the word architecture evokes for you from your background as a historian maybe you know the work of christopher alexander the timeless way of building and how how might this relate to design and business architecture around your model yeah architecture is uh, is is i would let's say i mean i'm often asked about leadership etc and I always say I, I much more feel like an architect or the gardener etc but I, I i like the idea of the architect much better because it's building about structures uh, but the funny thing is we we're, were invited to speak on a conference about urban development, uh, about, about, about self-organizing structures. So there are a lot of parallels uh, about, about this. Because if you watch, for instance, city development, the fun, and it is also an example which is often mentioned also by, uh, by Lalu in reinventing organizations or 
Uh, you see it, uh, Tony Shea of Zappos, etc. The funny thing is that when cities grow, they become more productive. And but this is this is this evolves somewhere automatically. And and with companies, it's exactly the opposite. So the bigger companies get, the less productive they get. So they, they just it goes down again. With cities or ecosystems, it's not. But if you why do we use the word ecosystem? Because in nature, this also works, but it's yeah. There is this kind of there is this kind of architecture, and it can be rainforest or a city development or states, etc. So I think yeah, architecture is, um, is 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 a pretty good word for this. I know the um, Jiang Ray Min, the CEO of Hire, he he was asked, um, did he see himself as the captain of the ship? And he said, no, he doesn't see himself as the captain of the ship. He sees himself as the architect of the ship. ship. Yeah. yeah, what I find, yeah. When, when I spoke at a higher conference, what really blew my mind was that he uh, talked about von Moltke, which is a German general mm-hmm. who lost against France, yeah. Jena, and, 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 and the German army, which was superior. I mean, we, we, we don't want to talk about this a lot. But, but this decentralized decision making, which was also uh, adapted by, by, let's say, the American army after the Second World War, was more or less um, rode down by von Moltke and, 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 and the CEO of Haya was using this. And I thought, incredible, this guy is sitting in China and he is, he is he's mentioning Haya because oh, uh, he is mentioning von Moltke. Because in the German language you have uh, you have words for this and they are not translated in American army literature. It's about auftragstaktik and befehlstaktik. And auftragstaktik means you have your mission. It's a mission, and people on the ground they have to they have to decide for themselves. And if you if you read for instance the book Why Leaders Eat Last, and you have this this special elite groups, they exactly function in the same way. They have they have a mission. But together on the ground, because situation changes all the time, they decide for themselves what is the next step to be taken. Hmm. No, interesting. No, I think I think one of the things about um, Shang Wei Min is is his great interest in in literature of all sorts and history. And I mean, he's a very um, unusual, I would say, unusual CEO in in the sense that he's incredibly well read. Um, yeah. you know, remarkable. Um, we, you you touched on on leadership and le- leader as architect, but um, Frank asks, from whom do you get open and honest feedback so that you can lead even better? And how does the feedback process work? Yeah, that's very funny because let's say the question is in the frame where we're not in. So we're not leading, so to say. So I have certain roles. And if people are interested in what I'm doing at Fizi, then they can just Google and one of the roles is talking to the public, but I don't have anything to do with advisors. I don't have anything to do with the credit department. So okay, people well, people solve this themselves. So let's reframe that question then slightly. Um, how how do you get your get feedback on whether you're fulfilling your roles um, optimally? Yeah, I'm just I'm just a member as everybody else in certain teams. So for instance, I am. I'm in the media team, and when I write something, and uh, my colleague doesn't like it or says I would do, I write it differently, then then I get feedback. It's like it's a little bit like the the Bono model of the of the hats. So you are just wearing different hats. But and for instance, I also I'm also not a CEO, so I'm 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 just one of the visionaries, and we also don't have business cards. So everybody is called a visionaire, and that's it. And then you have those roles. And then depending on the time you Google my roles, you find different roles. Oh, that's interesting. So that's, it's, it's that's, fluid. That, mm. that, that's it. Mm. Interesting. Do, do, you, do you think the Dutch culture is, is more open to this sort of organizational model? Yes, it is. Um, uh, the funny thing is that... Uh, uh, in the last, um, in in the book of Amy Edmondson about psychological safety and also decentralized decision making, on the last, on the last page of the book, she um, uh, she reflects on this. And then, if you, for instance, have this power distance, 
uh, which is in Scandinavian countries uh, and also in the Netherlands is much lower and it's easier to implement it. So, so you could say if you have a Republican tradition uh, and, and, and a very small power distance is much easier uh, because people are much more used to this. But on the other one, having said this, if you see von Moltke and, and the German army, which is, let's say, like we have, uh, let's say, learned about this in, in, in movies after the Second World War, it's always, we, I always had the impression, the German army, they're only, only shouting what other people have to do. And then only recently, two years ago, I, I found out that exactly the opposite is the case, that, that people in the battlefields had much more power, decentralized power, than in the American army. It was exactly the opposite. Hmm. So, so I even, on the one hand, you have this power distance topic, uh, which says Scandinavia and the Netherlands. But on the other hand, you have this idea of the Germans, uh, which, which, which are very vertical-oriented, uh, and, and pe people are not allowed to take their own decisions, which is not the case. So I think it's much more complicated. But the Chinese, you would exactly say the same. So if if you don't know higher, everybody would say, that's communism, and those people, they don't have their own opinion. And then you, you, you find out about higher, and then a lot of people with a very fixed idea of what China is would say, oh, it doesn't fit in my picture of what I think China is about. Mm. Do you then? I mean, it, it sounds as though obviously certain cultures would would take to this sort of model perhaps more naturally. Although, despite the fact you're sort of pointing out some paradoxes here as well with 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 the way this stuff works, but do you think we're moving in the in that in this the direction towards your model? Do you see more businesses doing this, or do you think that you're you're going to remain and 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 some of these other organisations we've touched on are going to be outliers and people are going to continue to do business with in the old sort of hierarchical way? Or is it a kind of inevitable sort of progression of history that, that, that history is moving in your direction? Oh, that's a very difficult question because let's say um, you always have to zoom out to see developments in the long term. So if you talk about democracy, at the moment we live in a time where everybody says now we're moving in the wrong direction, uh, watch all these dictatorships, etc. Um, but I think in the end, we're, let's say, if I, if I want to be positive, and I think uh, I am, then let's say from an organizational point of view, the more complexity you have, you can only solve this by decentralized decision making. So, and, and then you are back to tailor. So if you, if you make mo one model uh, in, 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 in a Ford factory and you put people in a line, that's, that's a different that's a different time you live in if you compare this with the services oriented industries or companies we have now where I think uh, everybody is moving towards uh, and, and and if you want to keep your people uh, then 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 yes you should give them freedom and trust them to take the right decisions because they, they are clever enough to do so so yes in the end I think everybody will will move in this direction but on this journey, there will be probably a kind of disruptions in between. How do you keep it simple, Tom? Because I mean, we all know that management and leadership, there's kind of basic, very, very straightforward principles in, in what you've got to practice. And what, and what you've mapped out is some ideas which are kind of straightforward in, intellectually for you to grasp, but actually delivering on them and keeping it simple has proved beyond a lot of organizations, the ad layers of hierarchy, they make it more complicated. How do you keep it simple? Yeah, that's a very good question because it's very simple to make things very complicated and very complicated to make things very simple. So, um, but to answer you with a very practical answer, we have this golden rule, uh, treat other people like you wanted to be treated yourself. And, and, and that applies to everything. So, so one has to, if you have this kind of rule, and I think it, it applies everywhere and in any situation, you have to repeat it all the time. And if something happens where you think, okay, that was not the case, you have to, you have to, let's say, um, also let's say with onboarding and when when a company grows, you have to repeat this all the time when you onboard people, so they feel safe, and then you're back about this environment of psychological safety that people don't fear to speak up and say, I don't think this is in line with our golden rule. And that happens 
if you don't have to be afraid that you lose your job, that you lose your bonus. So, so this whole psychological safety and the salary model makes it much more easy for people on the one hand to show vulnerability and to say, I, uh, we have more options. What do you think? Shall we move in this direction or in that direction? But also the other way around. You don't have to fear giving feedback to your colleagues because it doesn't have a negative, uh, let's say, repercussion. That's also the case where, let's say, a lot of stuff is always discussed about the 30, 60 degrees feedback. And I always say, how shall this work? You give feedback to somebody who decides on your bonus or what's, what's your logic behind this? So, but in the end, you need people and you have to put an enormous amount of effort in on the one hand, hiring, cultural fit, and then repeating and repeating all the time. But it's for the constitution, it is the same. Eh? So we have to repeat our basic values in the constitution about our, our liberties to not forget about them. Um, this is absolutely fascinating conversation, um, but we are running out of time. Where can people go to find out more about um, what you're doing? And I know we mentioned earlier you're, you do podcasts. I mean, you, you do book reviews, you do all sorts of things. Where, where should people go to see to, to learn more about what you're doing and, and some of the other um, interesting books that you're looking at and ideas that you're discussing? Um yeah, it's, we are very fortunate because of COVID. Um, uh, we did an enormous amount of different topics in the last two years. So if people are just interested in certain aspects, so you can just Google Fizi or my name and then in, com in combination with radical transparency, salaries, trust, golden rule, etc. And then you will probably find a lot of, uh, a lot of stuff also in English language. So. And otherwise, people can also connect if they have something very specific and they can't, can't find it. They can just also connect on, uh, on LinkedIn and I will answer their questions. Tom, thank you very much. Uh, refreshing and inspirational, I think. Tom van der Lubbe of uh, Vizi. Uh, thank you very much for joining us, Tom. Uh, and thank you, everyone, for joining us as well and asking such uh, brilliant questions. Uh, next week, we will be joined by Tamsin Webster. We can hope you can join us there. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me.